really want to share with you about the trip. We've talked about this a lot. Um, many of us personally have talked about this a lot and about how this trip was something that was not only um, not only something that, that challenged me and helped me to grow, but also something that I think in the long run helps all of us to understand a little more about who we are as a Christian group, as a Christian gathering, as, um, I guess, just as Christians who try to do what God's Word is asking us to do. So I want to start out by thanking you. Many of you helped me get there financially, and I think I can say all of you helped me get there through prayer. Prayer is, you know, money is important. We all know that. Money is important. But prayer is the thing that makes a difference. And so I really believe that as my church family, you all prayed for me while I was gone. You all prayed for me coming up to this, this trip, this adventure that I went on. And I know in some cases God put it on your heart. To help me get there financially. So I just want to say humbly thank you very much for both of those because without those there wouldn't be any point in having the rest of the service. Okay? So thank you very much for that. Uh, I was able to share the gospel while I was in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And I want to start by telling you, first of all, that the gospel is the good news. That's what gospel means, good news. We, who are servants of Jesus Christ, we have the best news. We know the absolute good news. It's Jesus Christ. What he has done has given us life. And I was able to go to Africa and share that same gospel message that I share from this pulpit every Sunday. And that to me was worth every dime. Whether I paid it out of my pocket or I had to go get a loan to do it, it's worth every dime to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with all who can hear. So I am sorry that it took me so long to present this, um, but I really feel like the, ser the, the sermon series that we were in just was too good, to be honest, Amen. for this interruption. This is a good thing, and I'm really excited to share it with you. But that sermon series that we were talking about, the life of Jesus, was just, it was, it had me. I'm sorry, it just had me. I was consumed with that study, and I just really felt like it was good. And I hope you got that same feeling on that. Amen. I want to start today by... I didn't bring my Bible with me. Where did I put my Bible? Uh, I want to start today by reading. Let me just open it on my electronics. By reading from Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to start in verse 18. Once you have turned there, would you please stand in honor and reverence to the Word of God. I'll be reading from the New, New American Standard Version. And it says this, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There ends the reading. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, I just thank you again that we can come into your house, be with your people, and share your word. We can share your word in so many ways, Lord, and, 
And you know how I've struggled over this week because I always feel like I want to preach what you have for us. But God, you assured me that in sharing this story, you will be preaching. So God, I ask that you would just be glorified through every one of these pictures, through every one of these comments, through everything that is said and done today, that you will be high and lifted up because you alone are worthy, Lord. And we'll give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so everything goes slow. You notice that? Okay, so um, what's happened is I truly believe that God, God calls all of his followers, everyone who follows Jesus, to minister in his name. I really believe that this scripture that I just shared with you is not a scripture to go into your neighborhood. It's not a call to go into your community. It's not a call to go into the tri-county. It's a call to go into all the world and share the good news that Jesus has conquered sin and death. And that he allows all of us who will follow him the ability to conquer sin and death. Amen. That's the gospel. That's the story. That's Jesus. And so that's why I considered going to Africa. That's the main reason, the main thing that made me have a desire to go to Africa. Now let me take you through an almost daily walk with me as I experienced this African adventure. It started with a lot of paperwork and added expenses. It seemed like, and I don't know if you know this, if you were close to me, I might have shared this with you, but it seemed like every week, the last six weeks or so, I got another email saying, you need to go here and spend this much more money and do this much more thing so that you can go to Africa. First it was, you need to go get a yellow fever shot. I already had a yellow fever shot. You need to go get a, a yellow fever shot. Well, after showing them the documentation, I didn't have to go get a yellow fever shot. But it was that. Then it was, you have to go get a license so you can ride a motorcycle. Then it was, you have to send this money so that we can do this with a backpack. Then you have to do this. So it was constantly asking for more money and more paperwork. That was leading up to the trip to Sierra Leone. But then on February 18th, Barb took me over to the Jacksonville airport where I began a very long trip on an airplane, actually three airplanes, to get to Africa. After changing around our bags, I was the first one there, um, and after changing around some bags and moving some things out of bags and into other bags, we were able to get all three of us checked in to get on the plane to head to Africa. Um, that would have been fine, except that we got over into the terminal, and the first thing we saw was that our plane had been delayed. <coughs> so we thought, well, let's be smart about this. Let's make sure that we're going to be able to get on a plane. So we went up and talked to the people, and we actually changed planes. So we were booked on two different planes. We were booked on a plane from Jacksonville to DC to Brussels, and then we were booked on a plane from Jacksonville to DC to London. Well, we got into DC about an hour after the plane to Brussels left because we had been delayed twice in Jacksonville. Uh, that happens, and there's nothing you can do about it. So we got delayed, we got to London in time to get on a plane to Sierra Leone. And we were able to do that, and we ended up being about an hour to an hour and a half behind the plane that would have gotten us there in the first place. <clears throat> the problem was that from D.C. we were all supposed to be traveling together, and instead we were four and three. But that's okay. We ended up in the same place together. It was really cool watching our plane on the monitor. If you've ever traveled... Uh, internationally, these bigger planes have these things. And they're GPS. 
And they really worked well, because I watched this as we were in the middle of the ocean and everywhere we were. <clears throat> and that's a little bit freaky when you know that you are over a whole bunch of water. <laughs> and it's not a good thing if you go down. That's what they tell you about grabbing that, that life cushion that nobody wants to touch because you've been sitting on it when you're going down. Um, but that's when you want to know where that stuff is. I can tell you, it was just a little different. Uh, really a different feeling. And then this is our first view of Africa. So we went from D.C. to, um, actually from D.C. to, uh, yeah, from D.C. to London. And then from London, this is the trip. I'm coming into Africa. And there's two of these. This is one and that's the other. And I really like that because I was like, wow, that's the, that's the picture of Africa that I see when I look at a map. You know? So it's funny too, and if you haven't figured this out, if you've ever done any kind of international tra tra uh, traveling, I have always thought of our country as kind of being the world. And as I've gotten older and gone more places, I see that it's so not. Uh, but I'm in a plane at about uh, between seven and 8,000 feet in the air, and I look down and I see the world like that. And it's just amazing to me because it's really perspective. It's very small. It seems big, but it's very small. Okay? Then I have some pictures that I just had to share some of these. These are really cool. This is the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert from about, again, about 8,000 miles in the air, 8,000 feet in the air, whatever that is. I don't know. Somebody can help me with that. If they know. <laughs> it's a long way up there. But anyway, these are these are. You can see some of the formations and and uh, how the wind blows and it changes things and it's constantly changing. The desert is constantly changing. Uh, I just feel like these are incredible. Uh, the more I looked, as soon as I figured out what I was looking at, I was just taken by that and I was glued to the window and just snapping pictures like. So, uh, when we finally made it to Sierra Leone, we found that five of our bags did not arrive with us. <laughs> Once again, if you've ever traveled internationally, you realize that you're really at the mercy of some other person, and yes. people make mistakes. Well, our bags did not get put on the plane with us. And so, we got there, and five of our bags did not. Now, I was pretty fortunate with that because um, I didn't. I was only missing a bag that I had taken for the the Jesus film trip, part of the trip. So I had all my clothes, I had all of my toiletries, I had all of the stuff that I needed to survive. One of our guys only had one bag, and he didn't have any of his clothes, and he didn't have any of his toiletries, and he didn't have any of anything that he needed, and. If anybody knows Ben Kesselring, <laughs> he is about 6'5 and about 285 to 300 pounds. Nobody else is his size. <laughs> so, so he had one change of clothes that he had in his carry-on and the clothes that he had on. And the Sahara Desert gives this little neat effect to all of the southern part of South Africa. And it's that time of year in February. And I don't remember what they called it. Uh, I tried to put that in my brain, but even by the time I got home, I couldn't remember. But what it is, is it is the winds blow across the desert and they bring the sand to the south side of Western Africa. And so it's just dusty and dirty all the time. If you look at LA and you see the smog, it looked like that. It looked like that, but it was not. It was not like man-made exhaust. It was dust, and it was constant in the air. So we were all coughing quite often, uh, coughing quite often. I want to make sure I pronounce that right. Okay. Um, when we got to South Africa, we got to. I'm sorry. When we got to Sierra Leone, Africa. Uh, with no bags, we had to do some paperwork. And so we were all, we went through customs and they looked at one piece of paper, which is really different because they usually go through everything. 
looked at one piece of paper and sent us over to fill out our paperwork for um, our bags that were missing. Well, because we got in there so late, everybody was gone by the time we were done filling out the paperwork, and they didn't even check us. They like pretty much said, okay, go ahead. And again, when you travel internationally, you'll understand this, but there are military men with big guns everywhere. Uh, so when we walked out, we had them in front of us, behind us, around us, and we met our missionary while we were there. The guy on the left there, his name is Larry Meyer, and he is uh, he's the missionary to South Africa in charge of the uh, Jesus <coughs> film and a lot of other different kinds of ministry. So if we were to ever go to South Africa, I don't know why I keep saying South Africa. If we were to go to West Africa, Larry would probably be the guy that we would be in contact with. He's in charge of all of that area, which is a big area. And then next to him is Pastor Vital Cole. Vi Vital is what we called him. Uh, we had one pastor that liked to say Vi Vidal, Vidal, but his name is V-I-D-A-L. Uh, if you know Cedric, you understand why it was by all. Uh, Cedric is from London, so kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. But Vital is the assistant DS to district superintendent to West Africa. So he was there, him and his wife were a big part of everything we did. Um, we took about a uh, half hour on a boat after we got there. To get across the river. This was neat. The river was a long way across. It was very wide and very choppy. Very disturbed water. The wind was blowing hard. We were bouncing like this, going up and down. Now, I know most of you, because you're like Floridians who love to get on the water on boats and do things, and I like that a lot but usually my stomach doesn't. <laughs> I just got off an 18 hour flight. I was already, my head was spinning a little bit. I was already a little bit on the, on the choppy side and then I got on that boat. So you know what I felt like when I got to the Sierra Leone, even though it was all Sierra Leone, the side that we were on, uh, you know what I felt like. And then I had to get in an SUV and drive down some roads that you'll get to see some of those pictures here in a minute. When we finally got to the guest house, we visited for a short time, uh, even though it was only 6.30 at night. After just a short visit, most of us kind of decided we needed to go crash. So we got our, as soon as it got dark, we went downstairs and got our beds all fixed up and, and went to sleep. Sierra Leone is six hours ahead of us. So at six o'clock, it was midnight here and that's when we got there and then we were up for a few hours before but we just kind of visited and, and did um, get to know you kind of stuff but then in the morning uh, we, we gathered upstairs and I, I'm going to show you a little bit about the safe house I called it the safe house it was called the guest house I'm going to show you a little bit about the safe house while we're there but in this house we had an upstairs it was a full house and downstairs it was a full house. And I guess all over Africa, I'm told, there is quite a bit of unrest. And so everything has bars and locks. Here's why I call it the safe house. In the downstairs where the men stayed, there was a regular heavy solid wood door. And it had two locks, one deadbolt locks, like manual deadbolt locks, where you could put a padlock on it. One on top, one on the bottom. It had a double locking deadbolt with a key in the, in, the, in the knob. Then there was a steel door outside of that that closed, had a key lock on it. And then it had three deadbolts that you could put padlocks in. Then you had your porch. And the porch was really nice. And we spent a lot of time on the outside porch upstairs. But downstairs, the, the porch had bars all the way across it with the door, and the door had was made of steel bars, and it locked with deadbolt locks or padlocks. You have to realize, when you go places like this, that at any point, there could be a military uprising. 
There could be a coup. There could be something that happens that causes a lot of unrest. And people have guns. And people have ways of getting in. And so this was why I called it the safe house. If we would have put all those padlocks on, it would have taken us 15 minutes to get in and out every time. <laughs> it's true. Now, God was there, and we had no issues, um, and it was very safe where we were. So, every morning, we would gather up, up on the upstairs, and I was in charge of our morning devotion. And I had been praying for a month beforehand, what do you want us to do, Lord? How do you want this devotion to go? And, you know, I'm going to be with three pastors and me, and then three other involved lay people, plus uh, a missionary and a district superintendent. Pretty much everybody knows their scriptures. What do you want me to do? And so I had I had a devotion with me that I was going to lead us through, and during our plane ride. I just kept praying, God, show me exactly where we're going. And he gave me that we were going to be reading in Ephesians. So I started out that first morning reading Ephesians 1. And I read about half of it, and I started to talk to everybody. And as I was talking, one of them, the missionary, said, I knew we were going to be in Ephesians. God revealed that to me a couple days ago. And I have been in Ephesians anyway, so I've been just studying it. And then one of the other pastors said, I didn't know we were going to be in Ephesians, but God's laid Ephesians on my heart recently. And I've been studying it and reading it. And one by one, either somebody had been studying, just finished studying, or had felt like they needed to study Ephesians. It was pretty amazing to me how God started our trip by giving scripture that we all needed to hear. And so our conversations on our morning um, our morning devotions were really pretty good. Uh, this is some of the pictures of our community. So this is right outside the snake house. I'm standing on the porch upstairs looking down. And this is, uh, if you look here, this right here is the community kitchen right there. They live in community. This, All of those houses there, they would gather there together and they would share life. Go ahead to the next one. This is the, that's the porch that I was standing on. And you can see that's Ben with his bald head and arms crossed. The one that's just a little bit bigger than everybody else on the porch. This is just looking a little bit to the left of where we were just looking. That's the car, the SUV that we drove around in all the time. And one night we actually showed the Jesus film in that community. We did that because um, we were really trying to connect there, and I'm probably getting off a little bit, but we were really trying to connect in that community, and, and the people there were very receptive. And so we asked if we could show the movie. We were not supposed to show the movie there. And we asked if we could show it. And we had about 160 people raise their hand and say they wanted to pray for salvation all over that. This is Cedric. And Cedric made me take this picture. He said, I have never held a half a million dollars in my hands before. <laughs> so that was $100 US, but everything is in a lot of money. So like 5,000 Sierra Leones is a dollar and a quarter. 5,000 Sierra Leones is a dollar and a quarter. So we gave $100 and we got Sierra Leone money and we couldn't carry that around. It was just too much, a lot of money about that thing. Cedric just had to have a picture so he could show his wife, and it worked out because I wanted to show you too. So this is more of our community. This is like right down the street from where we were, where I just showed you. This is going down into the town. <coughs> and just people walking and some of the, you can see some of the things there. That's the sidewalk. See the sidewalk? <laughs> That was very normal to have holes like that. Just a piece of the cement. That cement was about five inches thick. And I'm guessing that somebody dropped something and broke it, and they just never replaced it. So that's the sidewalk, and that's very normal all the way through town. And that's where they walk. That's also the street. And there's 
I asked Pastor Vital, I said, how many people live in Sierra Leone? He said, the country, we have about 5 million people. In Sierra Leone, Freetown, which is where we were, there's about 3,000 people. So 3,000 people, you can imagine what the traffic was like. That's actually a pretty small, pretty not so dense area, but it just gets a lot worse than that. And then about half the people have a little <coughs> motorcycle that they drive, and there is no one way or two way. You go whichever way you want to go on whichever side of the road you want to go, and you walk, the people walk in the middle of the street. And then you're driving down the road and you see somebody with a horse and buggy going down the street, which obviously slows down traffic. And then you see somebody with a horse and buggy with no horse, just a guy pushing that buggy. It's pretty amazing what how it all works together. I put this in here because I know we have firefighters, even though our firefighter <laughs> family is gone. Um, that was actually across the street in Jones Alley from Pastor Vital's church, but that's their fire department. Church of the Nazarene the Overcomers Assembly is Pastor Vital's church. And this is this is the main door in. And the next one will show you to where the two cars are. I'm going to show you another picture of that in a minute. Uh, where those two cars were is where we met a lot, uh, the guys. This this is the gates. So you can see this this gate is about this fence, which is made out of concrete. Uh, most of those had barbed wire or razor wire on top, and that is about six and a half feet high, maybe seven feet, and then they had steel gates get in. That's the church. That's the gates into the church. <laughs> so, and that's everything. Everything was like that. And I've been to some churches that have little gates, you know, and I always think, why do we have gates to our churches? Well, over here, everything, every house, every community, every yard has something like that. So we met with um, with the people at Pastor Vital's church to share a little bit about um, it, it was actually it was actually a get together of all of the local ministers. Some were pastors, some were lay ministers, some were like who we just gave certificates to. Felt a call when they were trying to grow, and so we met. This is inside of Pastor Vital's church, and we met there to um, have seminars. Each one of us that went over had to lead a seminar or two. Uh, and this is the praise and worship beforehand. And this is us getting ready to teach. <coughs> I led uh, a pastor's devotional and spiritual life. And then Pastor Ben and I shared the responsibility of, of leading growing a healthy church. So we led two or more each uh, for this to happen. Some of the others on our team led leadership, stewardship, discipleship, ethics, and women in ministry. All of those things were talked about while we were there. You can see this is one of the gathering places. This is where the cars were parked. And the guys met there most of the time. We met inside that first day, and then we met outside under these trees in this area most of the time as we were doing our seminars. This is very normal. We have children. We have any children around here? <laughs> yeah. We have children that would just stop by. It was the church. So they wanted to come by the church and they would see us. And I know this will surprise you, but we were some of the very few white people in the country. So they were inquisitive, very inquisitive about what are these white people doing here? What are they doing and why are they at the church? So they would stop and they would always ask us questions and we were always able to share the gospel with them. This is Pastor Stephen and he was uh, he was sharing the Evangel Cube. Some of you have seen the Evangel Cube I have on my desk. It's just, it's a cube that it has the story of Jesus. And so he was sharing that with these guys and every one of them prayed and every one of them asked Jesus into their life. And of course, there's no real way to follow up. So we don't know if they came back to church or not, but we invited them. And in most cases, 
we were able to introduce them to the pastor of the church in the community where we were. So it was kind of a way of at least trying to connect them with somebody. These are the motorcycles. Um, <coughs> two of those motorcycles were brand new. They were brought there from the Jesus Film Harvest Partners Ministries, and they were given to local pastors so they would have travel, a way to travel. You can see how big they are. They're 125s. Uh, for me, who rides a 1200 here, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, this next slide is where the women met. Now you can see, I was told that was a, a mango tree. I never saw a bit of fruit on it, and we ate mango every day. So I don't know, but I was told that was a mango tree. You can see how much shade there is. The next slide is actually the women meeting there. And they, uh, they gathered, they had a much, actually a much nicer place than we did. But uh, they only met twice in that area. And the rest of the time, the other people would go out into the community and just meet with people on their porches or on the street and talk to them. <coughs> This is the view of uh, just right up the road, right up, yeah, right up the hill from Pastor Biden's church. So you can see it's pretty wavy, pretty hilly. Uh, the people all live in very simple houses. See, most of these roofs are tin roofs. They're not tin like our roof. They're tin like just corrugated, corrugated metal that uh, most of us would not use for a roof. But, you can see all the way up the hill, that's kind of how that looks. And this is Freetown. Now the next one shows you the ocean. That's like starting where that last one left off going this way. And that's the Atlantic Ocean over there. So big, big city, very close houses, lots of people. <clears throat> uh, we really felt like we were supposed to connect to the people in our own little community where the safe house was. So we spent a lot of our free time out among these people in this community. <coughs> they had lunch every day for us, and lunch was at about 3.30. So we would get back from the pastor seminars, and I would say we took showers, but most of the time we didn't have showering ability. So we would wash off, change clothes, and then eat lunch. And then after lunch, we would go out in the community. And so this is, uh, you can see, if you look real close, this says RIP on the bottom of that rock that he's sitting on. Right at the edge, this is the edge of the community. Uh, and so the street is on the other side of that, of that picture. So if you look at where all that tin is, on the other side of there is the little street that they live on. And this is the edge of the graveyard on there. The next picture shows you another picture of the graveyard. It was a very large graveyard you know, right there on the edge of the community. And it wasn't very well taken care of. I was kind of surprised. With the community being right there, I figured that they would take care of their graves. But we walked around in there and not really, not really. One of the things that really struck me about Sierra Leone, actually not, well yeah, I was just in Sierra Leone. There was no grass, nowhere, no grass. Um, all red dirt, everywhere. So <clears throat> I don't know that grass wouldn't grow. Weeds grew a little bit but it was pretty barren and pretty dusty like that. So this is their houses. If you're looking from the graveyard up in between the houses, this is how close a lot of them were. And like I said, they live in community. So these pictures show how they work together every day. Go on to the next one. Again, this is that community I showed you before. These are all places of residence. All of these are houses where people, sometimes multiple families live. Same thing with this one. This was a really nice house, and that's the community kitchen and the community gathering place. And if you see right there the two towers, that's the mosque. That's where the Muslim mosque was, so right in the middle of this community. This is one of the gatherings getting ready to start. A couple ladies just walking around. You see, they carry everything on their heads. Uh, I was told that. Pastor Bible told me, if they were from Freetown, they never carried anything on their head. But those who were from the bush, those who were from the, the outskirts, they all carried stuff on their heads, and there was a lot of that. And you can see one of those guys that I was talking about right here. 
You see that right there on the side? That gun was about this long. After I took that picture, I was told, you're not allowed to take pictures of, of anybody in a uniform. Okay. So, <laughs> I don't know if I took another one or not. We had one guy who, he like video or videoed or took pictures of almost everything. So even when we were having the altercation with the cops on the side of the road, one of the big problems why we were there for 45 minutes was because the cop had a problem because he kept saying, that guy's videoing us, that guy's videoing us. And he kept saying, no, I'm not, and he'd turn off his phone. And then when the guy turned around and yelled at me about something, he'd start it back up. So um, he has video footage of a lot of things that we know. This is the soccer field in the community that we were staying in. And you can see, this is a real nice, almost level, not very much <laughs> soccer field. Look at how it really looks. Can you imagine playing soccer in that? <laughs> Most of them play soccer in bare feet. And that is rock. I mean, it's just rock. With, and that's what the road looks like. The road is the same way. And when we were going in and out of there, it was a very bumpy. I rode the motorcycle in and out of there twice. It was kind of scary riding a motorcycle. Even a 125 I could pick up and carry out. It was like, it's kind of scary because it's that's the road. A couple of the pastors decided one evening that they were going to share the gospel with all the children of the community. And so they got together and you could see, they, I mean, the kids were really excited. They, they connected with us a lot. And so they were really excited and they all came around and they were really good at listening well. And... Pastor Cedric started with, if you can hear me, clap your hands. You know that story, right? That works really well until it gets a little bit crowded. And as they were telling the story, they were using the bracelets like Denise just gave out that have the colors. And they were holding those up and talking about what the colors meant and how that worked. And then they started to hand out the bracelets. And this is what happened. It turned into a mob. Um, people just pushing and shoving and they wanted more than one bracelet they wanted more of everything and you can see this this wall this wall is actually the safe house so the safe house is right here and this wall is here and we started pulling people through the through the door because they were getting smashed up against the wall um, so what, what we had to do actually at the very end was just we all had to just walk away and go in the house and let it disperse um, because it just wasn't going to stop. Everybody wanted more. Everybody wanted more. We also took equipment that we used to show the outdoor movie um, in the remote areas. So this included projectors, screens, battery packs, and copies of the Jesus film in the Creole language. So this was all in this little box. And I actually took a, a backpack that weighed 50 pounds. Um, it was just a little bit too much because I had it in a, in a uh, piece of luggage and the luggage made it too heavy. So I had to take it out of the luggage and just take it as a backpack. That's the thing that got lost for me. But we got on our motorcycles and we headed out into, it was called Waterloo. It's an outlying area of Freetown. And we went out on our motorcycles, and you can see there's the four of us. We weren't allowed to get on the motorcycles in town, so they met us outside of town and had us ride from there. And uh, I just want to show you some of the things that we saw on our way. This is kind of a normal thing. They don't have a very good trash collecting way of doing that, if at all. So this is normal. This is the side of the road, and that's just garbage. I put that in there more or less for you, uh, you uh, cow farmers, <laughs> you that like your milk and things like that. So, but those are just there's road signs, uh, just like here. There's police stops, just like here, or well, maybe not. But you can see that's just you had to stop because the police were there, and they just put up that sign. And then just along the road, they just did this kind of stuff. That's actually a bread vendor those are loaves of bread and that's how they got their food people some people would make bread and that's what that is and then these are lumber yards i'm going to show you three pictures of the lumber yards that one is actually scaffolding that's scaffolding that's what they use for scaffolding 
They build their scaffolding out of all of those. And then this is the lumber yard just on the side of the road. Also, people just were selling stuff right outside their houses. So this is a house, and that is what they have for sale. Some of those houses were just houses. Some of them were just places of business, and some were both. This next one is both. Upstairs, that's where they live. Downstairs, that's where they keep all their appliances that they sell every day. <coughs> Then we came up to the district center, and the district center is in Waterloo. Uh, this is a plaque that's on the side of the building that says that this building was dedicated by the Olathe, Olathe College Church, which is in Kansas City. That is pretty much our college church. If we talk about college church, that's it. Um, there is a college church in every one of our towns that has a college, but this is the main college church. And that's the, that's the district center. We actually had some pastors that were there for the training that were uh, staying at the district center on the floor. The next one is, that's their training session. That's where, they, that's where they go for their training. And we rode our motorcycles there. It was really hard to get your motorcycle there because the mountain that this is on was really steep. And I had Cedric on the back of my motorcycle which he actually jumped off about halfway up because I couldn't keep the front tire down. And after he jumped off, I sat on the gas tank to get it the rest of the way up the hill. It's that steep to get up to that, that uh, district center. See the razor wire on the walls? And that goes all the way around the, de the district center. And then we got out to where we were showing the movie. And of course, this was the main reason we went although this was the least important for me. I don't know why that is, but it just was. So these next few slides are really just them building the stage so they could show the movie. <coughs> Personally, I really enjoyed working with the local pastors. Especially, I connected with Pastor David, Pastor Stephen, and Pastor Emmanuel. Pastor David lived in the community where the safe house was. And his church was just down around where I showed you that first picture of the Coke, the, the, the Coke emblem there, or I don't know what you want to call it. But anyway, he, his church was right across the street from there. Pastor Stephen, this is Pastor Stephen's church, and I got to preach there on Sunday morning. <coughs> um, I, I preached through an interpreter, but that's, uh, that's the church. This is the church inside. You can see the walls are not very finished. It's just an adobe brick type building, and that's what it looks like inside. And you can see there was over 80 people in this building. The other one, the next one is the other side of the church, and the main door is outside, and obviously I'm standing in the front of the church at that point. There's the church, pretty as close as I could get to the whole group. There was a lot of children, but Pastor Stephen actually has a he has a um, a school that he runs in his church and in his community, and a lot of those kids are there in that service. And it's pretty much like it is here, in that kids like to get their pictures taken. So I have. I don't know, somewhere around 300 pictures of, that look a lot like that. that are just kids that wanted their picture taken. I want to share a little bit of the worship. Well, wait a minute. I might be wrong. What's the next slide? That's, yeah, it's a song. Okay. Wrong. I'm in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. I want to share a song. And I see that I've already bored most of the kids to sleep. But if you're awake, if you're awake, I'd like you to try to share it or try to sing it with me. It's not very hard, and I think the kids would like it a lot. You see, it's I'm wrapped up, bound up, tied up with Jesus. I'm wrapped up as this, I'm bound up as this, and tied up as this. Okay? Wrapped up, bound up, tied up with Jesus. Okay? Stand up. 
They did everything at Pastor Stevens' church a cappella except one song. It was uh, Ancient Days, if you remember that song. They used a cell phone. <laughs> I thought it was funny. They used a cell phone and held it up to the microphone and they played Ancient Days. But everything else was done a cappella. And Pastor Stephen shared this, this song with me. He said, I want you to share this with your church. So I'm going to share it with you. It says, I'm wrapped up, bound up, tied up with Jesus. I'm wrapped up, bound up, tied up with Jesus. I'm wrapped up, bound up, tied up with Jesus. Jesus is the only way. I'm wrapped up, bound up, tied up with Jesus. I'm wrapped up. Bound up, tied up with Jesus. I'm wrapped up, bound up, tied up with Jesus. Jesus is the only way. You guys are good sports. <laughs> Thank you. You can sit. Pastor Stephen was a gardener. And uh, so this is his garden. He was very proud. I wanted to show us his garden. So after church, he took us out to the garden. This is maize and okra. Ooh, oh, maize and okra, and he grew them in the same field, they grew them together, and we had maize almost every day. Have you had maize? <laughs> so maize is corn, but it's kind of between field corn and sweet corn. It's not quite as hard as field corn, but it's definitely not soft like sweet corn. So we had it every day, like I said, it was good, but it was different. He's a farmer, and so he also has pigs and chickens and other things like that too. And then he took us all the way to the back. And this is the foundation for the new church. This is how they build things. They are saving, see those blocks in rows? They're saving the blocks. As they can, they make or purchase more blocks. And when they're done, when they get enough, they'll start putting them on that foundation right there. That foundation, and that's where they're going to build their next church. So it's just in the backyard of the new church, or the church they're in now. Um, this is the world, and this is what I believe. God has asked us to go into all the world and make disciples. This is a scripture I share with you. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. That's what God is asking us to do. That's why I went to Africa. That's why I came to Trenton. And that's why I go anywhere I go. So I want to share with you that my heart is that we go and we make a difference wherever we go, however we go. There were three of us that just had to take a picture. I don't know why, but this is what you look like when you go into all the nations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's it. Get off of that. We're going to take communion together as an assembly of God that is trying to make a difference where we are. And while we're doing that, I'm going to share some African worship. I was actually supposed to share this during what I was speaking, but since it took so long to get there, I didn't want to, didn't really want to do that. So I'm going to share some of what it looked like or what it sounded like in Pastor Stephen's church on Sunday morning when we were worshiping together. And it goes a little bit like this. And then as I play this, I'm going to ask that you come forward. Barb's going to help me serve communion today. And I know that I've had you come up and dip in the cup and do all those kind of things. It's kind of in the middle. I have, I'm going to serve you the bread, and she's going to have the cup. And I'm just asking that you take one of each and then go back to your seat, okay? And we'll take it together. But I just feel like we need to make that move to the table where Jesus meets us, where he's asked us to come so that we can all gather together 
as one community with Christ at his table. Right? So let me invite you to stand and I'm going to set this Loud. If you'd like to join us in taking communion, would you just come forward? I don't think we need to do any certain way. Just come forward and take up the elements and then we will partake together at your sins. 